Let us uh, take a moment now as we turn uh, in scriptures to the eighth chapter of Romans. Indicated, we are going to follow through uh, what is a theme of God's sovereignty in salvation, as it's outlined in some detail for us in particularly verse 29 and 30 of Romans chapter 8. The theme for this morning is from heaven a call, but is it for all? And you'll find uh, our reference in verse 30, moreover whom he predestined, these he also called. Now, having confirmed the fact of God's foreknowledge based upon his predestination, Paul now sets out the procedure by which, in which, through which, this purpose of God or this decree of God will be accomplished. In order to engage in the purposes of God, our lives must be relieved of the burden and the guilt of our sin. We drew uh, attention to that in a small measure last Lord's Day as uh, we looked at that lovely verse in Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verse 8 leading through verse 9 and 10, that describes the work of God in his saving grace. For by grace are you saved through faith. And so when we ask the question, if we need to have our sin removed, our sin dealt with fully, uh, then we must know where to go and to whom we must go in order to have that need fully met. Now, in our present world, there are many alternatives <clears throat> that are presented to us. <clears throat> we see it, for example, in false religion. We have it presented in fanciful philosophy and uh, many, many alternate uh, options are offered as being appropriate for man to deal with the problem of sin. But as we read through the Bible, we discover that there are warnings that are specifically related even to this very issue. If you turn, for example, to the 24th chapter of Matthew's Gospel and uh, look at verse 21 through to 26, you find that Matthew has been uh, concerned about this uh, same issue. And uh, in the context of his teaching on the second coming of Jesus, he records the words that Jesus spoke that uh, remind us of the end times. <clears throat> As you read through Matthew 24, you very quickly begin to associate many of the sayings of Jesus, the prophetic teachings of Jesus, with the current environment and atmosphere and the climate of the world of our time. We are warned of the coming of the man of sin. We're also reminded that the spirit of uh, the man of sin is already in the world, the spirit of anti-Christ. I've had a number of uh, folks comment to me this uh, past week or two that they have noticed that there seems to be a particular emphasis on a kind of hidden uh, persecution of the church and of the people of God. It is becoming more and more difficult to live out our life in the atmosphere of a current climate set against the rule and the authority of God. But here in Matthew 24, we're warned that this will happen. And here in particular, 
in verses 21 to 26. Matthew uh, records these words of Jesus. Look at Matthew 24, verse 21. Then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. False Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he is in the desert, do not go out. Or, look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. There is only one Savior. There is only one message of salvation. There is only one provision of the grace of God that alone can deal with the problem of our sin. There is only one who can say, Come unto me, and I will give you rest. And you find that recorded in Matthew 11, verse 27 through to verse 30. So here in this 30th verse of Romans chapter 8, we have the significance of this statement, moreover whom he predestined, whom he chose, whom he selected, whom he elected, whom he predestined, these he also called. Well, as we uh, look at uh, this reference, we want to examine this teaching for a few minutes this morning uh, by gathering around three uh, distinct thoughts. First of all, we must note the reason for the call. These he also called. What is the reason for the call? Well, we could spend long hours considering the full impact of the teaching of the Bible in relation to the coming of the Lord Jesus. Suffice it to be reminded of that text in Matthew 9, verse 13, where Jesus explained to his disciples, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So here, in a nutshell, is the gospel freely explained, simply stated. Jesus came to call sinners to repentance. There is no other remedy for sin. There is no other hope for sinners. But having acknowledged the call is a call to repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus, we must also remember the nature of, of the call. What does the call mean? Well, as we go through the scriptures, we discover a theme that is presented, which we will follow for a few moments this morning, that demonstrates that there is that sense of the call of God coming in two ways, in two forms, and each produce a different effect. There is the universal call. It can be aligned with the doctrine of common 
grace. In that God has revealed himself to all. The message of the gospel is presented to all. It is universal in its approach. But then within that general nature of the call of God, as he reveals himself to the world, there is the effectual call. The effectual call is more specific, more pronounced, more unique. All will hear the call of God, the universal call of God, but not all will hear the effectual call of God. Come over in your Bible to Matthew chapter 20 and look with me at an illustration of this theme. Matthew chapter 20. Here in Matthew chapter 20 and verse 15 and 16. Here is that statement of Jesus that relates to what we were looking at last uh, Lord's Day, the absolute sovereignty of God, the potter having the right to make a choice and to furnish upon the wheel a vessel pleasing unto him. Here in uh, this reference, speaking of the parable of the vineyard, Jesus makes a comment in the face of the questioning workers who felt that he was unjust in his ways. And here is what Jesus said. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? There is this simple exclamation for the grounds upon which the sovereignty of God is taught and is known. He has the right to make the choice and to deal with his own as he pleases. Then we come into verse 16. So the last will be first. And the first, last, for many are called. There is the universal call. Many are called, but few chosen. There's the effectual call. As we read in Romans chapter 9 last Sunday morning, we noted there that that uh, God uh, takes the lump, the same lump, and he does what he wills uh, from that lump. Here is the same thought expressed by uh, Jesus recorded in the Gospel of uh, Matthew. And so we uh, are reminded uh, that all through the Scriptures, this theme is, uh, is followed. Come over into Matthew chapter 13 for a moment. Matthew chapter 13. And notice how Jesus is uh, illustrating this fact. 13th chapter of Matthew. We'll read from verse 10 through to verse 12. And the disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? He answered and said to them, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it has not been given. There again we have the effectual call and the general universal call. Verse 12, for whoever has to him more will be given. He will have abundance. 
But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. If we substitute the gospel and the saving grace of God, then in the end, we will lose it all. So here Matthew reminds us of the sovereignty of God in his call. In John chapter 5, let's go to John chapter 5. And in John 5, verse 39 through to verse 42, we find Jesus again reminding us of this truth. In the 38th verse, he said to the Pharisees, but you do not have his word abiding in you, because whom he sent, him, you do not believe. We can be religious, but if we don't have Christ, then our religion is of no value to us. Here Jesus continues, You search the Scriptures, verse 39, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. And he adds, But you were not willing to come to me that you may have life. Now, this is not, once again, an explanation. This is a statement. Jesus knows what is in their heart. He knows that they will not come. The universal call will not become an effectual call. On the other hand, in John chapter 10, Look at John chapter 10, verse 24 to 28. John chapter 10, verse 24 to 28. Then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, Tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you did not believe. Notice in verse 24, this is the Jews he is referring to. I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me but you do not believe. Why? Because you are not of my sheep. As I said to you, my sheep hear my voice. There's the call of God, the effectual call of God. And I know them, and they follow me and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Here is the call. The Jews heard it, but rejected its truth. Those that heard the effectual call of God to the heart responded, believed, and came to the Lord. Jesus. Look over at chapter 6 of John's Gospel. Verse 37. John 6, verse 37. Jesus said, All that the Father gives me will come to me. The one who comes to me, I will in no means All that the Father has given to Jesus will hear his call. 
and they will respond and they will follow. Let us notice, secondly, in our theme for this morning, the reception of the call. Come back over into Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 13, and we'll read this time from verse 13 through to verse 17. Matthew 13, verse 13, 17. Now take particular note, pay particular attention. These are important references. Therefore, I speak to them in parables because seeing they do not see and hearing they do not hear nor do they understand. And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled which says, <clears throat> no, <clears throat> hearing you will hear and shall not understand. Seeing, you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing and their eyes they have closed. Lest they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. So here we have the eyes, the ears, and the mind. Now take your Bible and follow me through as we relate that to the text in Romans 8, verse 30. These he also called. How does the call of God reach us, and how do we respond to it? First of all, we'll go to Luke's Gospel, chapter 24. Luke's Gospel, chapter 24. Look at verse 44 through to 45. Luke, chapter 24. Now, we won't read through all of these uh, verses. But you'll discover in the preceding verses, 31 to 33 particularly, the two are on the road to Emmaus. And uh, they are wondering what the events of the recent times really meant. And how they could unravel the death of Jesus, how it related to them in particular. And if you look at uh, verse 44 to 45, you'll see how this story unfolds. We'll read verse 31 um, through to 33 first. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us? on the road while he opened the scriptures to us. So they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven who were with them gathered together. What's the first thing that happened? Their eyes were opened. Verse 31. 
Now we come down into verse 44. They've gone back to Jerusalem. They're now in the upper room with the other disciples. And they're recalling and recounting the story of their passage, their travel and the Emmaus Road and how Christ appeared to them. And uh, as they share, let's go to verse 44. Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you. Jesus has appeared now to these disciples. That all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets the Psalms concerning me. And note these words. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend Scripture. You remember what the prophet Isaiah spoke of? Their ears, their eyes, their understanding, their mind. That even though they heard, they couldn't perceive, they couldn't understand, they couldn't receive because they were not receiving this effectual call of God upon their heart. I'll come over into Acts 16. Acts chapter 16. And here in verse 14 in particular, we're reading about Paul going to Derby and Lystra, how here he uh, meets up with a, a lady who is a seller of purple. Verse 14, a woman called Lydia. He begins to share with her and those who have gathered. Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshipped God. The Lord opened her heart to hear and to heed the things spoken by Paul. So here we have the open eye. Verse 31 of Luke 24, the two on the road to Emmaus, their eyes were opened. We have the disciples in verse 33 and down to 45, their understanding was opened. Here in Acts 16, 14, the heart was opened. So God opens eyes minds, and hearts. So this is how God called in and through his word. How does God call us today? Come over into 1 Peter. 1 Peter. Chapter 2. Verse 9 and verse 10. 1 Peter 2, verse 9 and 10. But you are a chosen generation. Now that is in contrast to those referred to in the preceding verse. They stumble being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. Here is the vessel of dishonor. Here is those who hear the universal call, but do not respond to the things of God. They stumble, being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. But you, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He opens the eyes of the blind out of darkness into light. 
Uh, let's go through to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 9. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Our mind are open. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And at verse 12. That you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Our hearts are open. So the call of God is a call out of darkness into light. It's a call to understand the truth of our salvation and the saving grace of God. It is a call to embrace and be embraced by the glory of God. It is an effectual call. So we go back to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And here we are reminded by the apostle, moreover, whom he predestined, these, he also calls. What does this mean, you ask? Let's go back to Romans chapter 1. Look at verse 7. Here Paul puts it in a nutshell. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saved. What does that mean? Back in Romans chapter 8, verse 29, whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become saint or to be conformed in the image of his son. Have you heard the call of God? The effectual call of God. Remember, as the Father draws, we respond to the call, the challenge of the gospel. As we open our hearts to receive the grace that saves, they that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He will hear our call as we call upon him in response to his call upon us. Will you call upon him today? Let's bow. Our loving Father, we continue to rejoice in your word and pray that you will confirm its work within our heart. That we will not simply go through our days accepting the good news of the gospel without receiving the crown of the gospel as our Lord and Savior. Help us to feel the tug of heaven upon our soul today. May we hear the voice of Jesus say, Come unto me, and I will give you rest. As we come, as we call upon the name of the Lord, may we know in our heart that we are responding to your call 
to us. For you have made it an effect. Through Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen.